This podcast is brought to you by the North Dakota Petroleum Foundation. From heating our homes and powering our vehicles to cell phones, clothing, and medical equipment, oil and natural gas makes everyday life better. North Dakota Oil and Natural Gas, advancing the possibilities. Learn more at ndpetroleumfoundation.org. Welcome to Plain Talk Live. I'm your host, Rob Port. So term limits are a thing that people like to talk about. Many states have it implemented. North Dakota does not. In fact, I think North Dakota has shot down in the past multiple attempts to implement term limits. But this election cycle, there's a uh, a group of, and I, I think it's fair to say that this is their baby when you look at the at the sponsoring committee. Um, a group that I've, I've been writing about a lot. I know we've been talking about a lot here on Plain Talk the uh, the quote unquote Bastiat caucus, sort of the the very hardcore Trumpist wing of the North Dakota Republican Party, and I I should I should be very precise because I think a lot of people are saying, well, I voted for Donald Trump, but I'm not with those people. I, these are the hardcore Trump supporters. These aren't the I voted for Donald Trump because the alternative was Hillary Clinton. I understand people who made that decision. Um, I couldn't bring myself to vote for Donald Trump, but I don't begrudge people that these are the these are the fan club people. Right. These are the people who are flying the flag out on the front porch. That's who these folks are. And and they're behind a ballot measure to implement term limits coming after a, a, a reorganization cycle this spring where they attempted to take over the North Dakota Republican Party and they failed pretty miser- miserably. Um, so there's an aspect, I mean, I, I think there's two parts of this, and I'm going to be joined here in a moment by my guest, Chad Oban. Um, what is the policy question? Is this good policy for the state of North Dakota, all the politics and everything else aside? And then obviously there's the political question. So um, we could start with the policy side, and I actually have some of the, some of the text for the uh, term limits ballot measure that I could show up on the screen because I want to run through of what this actually does. Um, First of all, and I'm I'm just bringing this up now, uh, the term limits would apply to the legislature and the governor, and that's it. Um, So ag commissioner, attorney general, secretary of state, superintendent of schools, these statewide offices would not fall under this constitutional amendment for for term limits. Um, It's the legislature and the governor and that's it. Also, another another thing about it is it's it's cumulative. So if you have a lawmaker who gets appointed to finish another lawmaker's term, they can't serve more than eight years cumulatively. So let's say uh, a lawmaker resigns or or they pass away or something in the middle of their term, somebody else gets appointed for the final two years of that term. Um, and then they get elected to another term in their own own right. By the time that term's over, you're talking about six years. They wouldn't be able to run for election to for another term uh, because that would put them over the eight year eight year cumulative thing. Or, or I guess maybe they could run for election and have to resign. I don't know. Maybe that's a question for the courts. The other interesting thing about the measure is that it um, it prohibits the legislature from amending this part of the law or excuse me from initiating a ballot measure to amend this law in the future which is really interesting now in north dakota every constitutional amendment gets voted on by the people they can be initiated one of two ways either the legislature can initiate one or people can collect signatures from on the and, and put it on the ballot box themselves but no constitutional amendment in north dakota can become law without it being voted on on the ballot by the people. And essentially what this measure says is the legislature can't initiate an amendment, which I I think is an interesting constitutional question. Can you limit the legislature's ability to legislate? Um, I'm not so sure you can, but I don't know. And then finally, maybe as a, as a, a tacit admission that that attempt to limit the legislature's ability to legislate might bring up constitutional questions. uh, There's a severability clause or severability section, which essentially says if one part of this constitutional amendment is struck down, the rest of them stand. Um, so that's that's it. That's what the um, that's what the measure 
says, and I'm, I'm taking the graphic down off the screen. And, and first of all, let's let's talk about the policy aspect of this, Chad. What do you think? Is this good policy? Is this something that's that's right for North Dakota? Well, first of all, it's clearly Red Polo Day on the Rob Port Chad Oban hour. Yeah, that's right. Uh, on the radio. Well, that's well, um, Chad and I coordinated. We called ahead and, and made sure. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things I just want to clarify, it's eight years in, in each chamber, right? So somebody that's could be eight right. years in the Senate and then be eight years in the House. That's correct, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm opposed to term limits. I mean, just generally speaking, I'm opposed to term limits uh, at the state level, uh, at the congressional level. I know it brings up the question of you support term limits at the executive level, and I think that's a slightly different uh, conversation. Um, but you know, I hate to sound uh, too much like you, Rob, but I mean, we hey. have elections, hey. right? I mean, we have elections. That's when we have our term limit. So I, I just think that it's probably uh, in, in experiencing the legislature firsthand. I mean, you know, it takes some time for legislators to figure out the process. And if you start limiting them to eight years, I mean, often people are just figuring it out in their third, fourth, fifth, sixth year of how the process works that um, I, I just think it's bad policy. Um, the other question I have is when does the clock start running? Is it so, I mean, we're not looking back, right? So Ray Holmberg isn't going to get kicked out of office when this thing passes. His eight years would start when this thing passes, correct? Right. So he could he could get up into the 50-year mark, I guess, if he wanted to. Yeah. So most people aren't even, like most people sitting in the legislature right now aren't going to be affected by this. This is going to be, you know, eight years, 10 years down the line. Uh, and I just worry about... Um, the quality of our legislators we will have if we're constantly churning out new people, because there's a lot of veteran legislators that the institution, um, it'd be difficult to move without people who have that historical knowledge uh, on policy and where we've been from a budget perspective, from a tax perspective, from a funding perspective. Um, I just think that historical perspective is a good one. Well, something that, that interested me is is the perspective of um, your in chamber leadership, so your your how your majority leaders, your minority leaders, um, one lawmaker, and I won't I won't because we we were having an off the record conversation, but I I thought they made a really good point. Um, is a, a a relatively new lawmaker would saying you know basically I would be coming up on the end of my term in office if this was right. you know and I've I've been I've been reelected once he said it really at this point I I should run for for majority leader because. Why, uh, you know, and that's the thing, too, that, that really struck me, like all of a sudden your majority leader is going to be somebody who's maybe in their second term and now they're the majority leader of, of the House. I, I feel like that position requires I mean, typically the people who hold that position are people who have been in the House or the Senate, as the case may be, for a while and have, you know, they've established a track record. They've become comfortable with a lot of policy areas. And now they're in a position to not just represent their district, but also lead their caucus in the chamber and you're going to ask somebody who's who's in their fifth or sixth year in the legislature to do that i i think that's a bad idea right and i also think that the the drafters of the, this amendment did make a mistake by doing eight and eight i mean if they would have done just like 12 12 or 16 just in one chamber you take away some of that uh, but even somebody who served eight years in the senate and then goes to the house i can't imagine a lot of senators wanting to downgrade to the house uh, after eight years but i assume that happens in other states Down, downgrade to the house <laughs> hey, wow I was, says I was the husband of the as... senator <laughs> no i think i'm quoting many a senator i've heard over the years up at the legislature yeah quoting uh, many a senator let's let's get some <laughs> house members on the record how they feel about I'll... the state senate Especially, especially after I, this, especially after this last session, by the way, um, which uh, we're not going to get into on this show. Rob, but. I should also point out, I'm the son of a uh, my late father served in the House for 14 years, so I think I'm sort of neutral on this one. All right, okay, uh, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but I, I think that eight years is too short in one chamber. When you talk about leadership, when you talk about running committees, um, you know, again, being up there, uh, even if there's people I don't necessarily agree with. Watching how a Don Shively runs the Senate Education Committee, I mean, he's been around for a while. He knows the players. He knows the, the, the what's happened in the past, and it, and it's good to have that sort of. And the rest of his committee, other than Senator Oban, were all pretty much freshmen this last time. And so, I mean, I just can't imagine some of these committees trying to function, let alone the majority leader. 
if they've only been in their session or two. So that, that brings into another, so, so even if, if, and I honestly, I wouldn't like it, even if you said it at 16 years or 20 years and, and here's why. And, and this is the thing that, that has turned me off about the term limits <laughs> movement. Um, it, whenever this issue comes up, it's, it's fundamentally a populist issue, right? Like it's, it's this, it's this sort of, you know, we, the P and even if you listen to a lot of the supporters and by the way, I, I should be clear, maybe I didn't listen to that. Jared Hendricks is the, the chairperson. He's kind of the organizer behind the Bastiat caucus. He's a political consultant that lives in Minot. A lot of the sponsors on the sponsoring committees are, are sitting state lawmakers like Rick Becker, Jeff Hoverson, Oli Larson, who are, are Becker founded the, the Bastiat caucus. Oli Larson is the current chairman of the Bastiat caucus. That's who this is. So it's, it's a very sort of chest pumping anti-establishment, you know, we, the people are going to assert our powers. Um, that's kind of the tone that's made an argument for this, but what it does is, as a practical matter is it tells voters who they can't vote for, right? If there's a, if there's an incumbent who might want to serve a third term in the house or the Senate, um, this, this tells the voters you can't vote for them. It doesn't matter how much you like that person. You can't elect them at least to that chamber again. And also the governor, you know, if, if you have a governor that you like and they want to run for a third term, which I think governor Doug Burgum will, despite in 2016 running campaign ads uh, about which Chad had to point out to me, I had completely forgotten that the governor was running campaign ads promising support for term limits. And here we are. I guess we'll see. I haven't heard him say anything about this yet. I guess we'll see what he what he has to say. But I, I don't I don't like this idea. Like, you know, we're going to we're going to strike a blow for the people by limiting who the people can vote for. That makes absolutely no sense to me, Chad. Right. And I think, Rob, the proponents would say, well, the people are going to vote and put this in the Constitution. But again, I'm telling people in the other 46 legislative districts who they can and cannot vote for yeah. uh, by voting for this constitutional also, measure. Also, electorates aren't permanent like this, this electorate. Right. Uh, any any given election is, is kind of okay. a snapshot in time. So this electorate is going to tell future electorates, including voters who maybe haven't been born yet, voters who don't live in our state yet, voters who aren't old enough to vote yet. We're going to tell them who they can vote for. I have a problem well, with that. Yeah, and I think, you know, you pointing out who some of the sponsors of this thing are, Rick Becker and Ole Larson. Well, Rick Becker was elected the first time in 2012, so I suspect he'll want to uh, live up to these values and not run for re-election in, in 2022, right? Because he, he only wants to serve for eight years. Ole Larson should resign today because he's already been in the Senate for over eight years. I mean, it, it just it sort of reeks of hypocrisy if, if folks are calling for term limits and they're not even living by the own rules that they support. And, and I understand that we have the rules. We sort of like a Major League Baseball um, uh, salary cap, right? People complain about the Dodgers getting. Well, that's the rules. But uh, I think that if Ole Larson, Rick Becker and some of these others that have been there for eight years drop out. I mean, if you think that it's having veteran politicians in there, just don't run for re-election. Let other people fill yeah, your role. Yeah, practice, pra have the courage of your convictions and and drop out. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that's I think that's a fair question to ask them. What do you think when I when I saw this? And again, I I mean this this looks like I th I think that this ballot measure, although my understanding is they have financial backing from U.S. term limits, which is a national single issue group, and and I'm sure they're gonna. They're going to dump some money into this and they're going to pay to collect signatures because in North Dakota, uh, the initiated measure process is really just about how much money you have to buy your way onto the ballot. Um, uh, when you look at who's behind this and then you look at the curious way, wh why, why term limits for the legislature and the governor but not the attorney general? I mean, if we believe in term limits as, as a concept, right, if you buy into that, why not the superintendent of schools? Why not? the insurance commissioner. Why just why just the governor and the legislature? And so I'm looking at it. I think that this is very much a product of the rift in the, the North Dakota Republican Party, where you have sort of the Bastiat caucus, hardcore Trump people who are, are just trying to, I, I think in some ways, just create chaos. And this is this is their way of striking out. And it's it's about they don't like Governor Burgum and they're upset because the legislature expelled Luke Simons. So who are they targeting? They're targeting the legislature and the governor, which, again, if this was if this was about term limits as a concept, as a philosophy, as an idea, then wouldn't you apply it to our other statewide elected officers? 
But, but but the people that they're mad at, again, this isn't going to affect, right? The clock starts running if this thing's passed. Doug Burgum's not going to run for another eight years after his next election, right? I mean, most of the legislators that they're mad at, I mean, they're not going to be there eight years from now. Uh, I think the hypocrisy about term limits really showed up last session. I don't know if you know, you saw this, but there was a, uh, a resolution urging Congress to implement term limits on members of Congress. And Ben Koppelman was the primary sponsor. I actually went through the sponsorship list and the vast majority have served in the legislature for over 20 years. And they were supporting term limits for Congress. But when Ben Koppelman was sort of called out on the idea of, well, why Congress and not us? He basically said, well, we're different. We're, we're citizen legislatures. We're above. We're, we're better at our jobs than those folks in Washington. I, I just think the whole thing is hypocrisy, you know, term limits for them, but not for me sort of thing. Yeah. And I think we're going to see that a lot in the, from legislators who've been there, what that they support term limits and have signed the you know, U.S. term limits pledge for Congress. But they don't think it should apply to them in North Dakota. Well, let's I, I, I do. I, somebody somebody challenged me on the idea. They asked me, "Well, don't you?" Because I don't support term limits as a, as as a concept. But they said, "Well, do you support term limits for the president?" And I said, "Well, yes, I do." And the reason why is because, and I, I guess I'm going to make the same argument that Ben Koppelman did, because the presidency is fundamentally different than the North Dakota legislature. And so I guess I don't see Congress as being that much different from the legislature. But I. You know, I, I don't I don't want to be dismissive of, of Representative Koppelman's argument because he's he's right. I mean, it is different. It's a different level of government. The federal government is a different animal than than the state government. And I, so I think it's fair if we're talking about term limits on different levels. I support term limits for the presidency, and that's pretty much it. And the reason why for the presidency is because that has its roots in the American Revolution. We fought the war to get away from a monarchy, right? And if you have, uh, you know, a sort of permanent president, you're not that far from a monarchy. So to my mind, the presidency is, I mean, it's, it's, it's the elected head of a huge country. I like the, and we have the tradition. Washington started the tradition. Most presidents have abided by it up until we made it law in, uh, what was it? The forties. It was after FDR, maybe the fifties. I'm forgetting when we passed that amendment. Um, but I, I, I'm so I, I don't, I mean, I, I understand that. I mean, it's not the term limits are bad, but I think they're bad for North Dakota. Um, and especially I think yeah. like, like some of these rural legislative districts, I mean, think of the talent pool. It's hard to recruit good candidates in, in some parts, some areas of our state as it is, even some of the postage stamp size legislative districts in, uh, in urban community, more urban community, like, uh, like Fargo, it's hard to find good people within there who can run and, and be viable candidates and would be competent in the legislature. Now you got to turn them over every eight years. That's a terrible idea. Yeah, and, and I but but I think the same argument can be made for for Congress, right? The the talent level, uh, getting to know the process, all that. I think it's more of a not federal versus state, but executive versus legislative uh, difference. I mean, I, I I don't like term limits at all. Um, I mean, I could see them for the governor's office more than the legislature. Um, just because you've got the bureaucracy that surrounds the governor um, that you can continue to function. But I don't know. It's it to me again, it's just the, the hypocrisy of folks being in office for 20, 25 years saying that there should be term limits on other people. Uh, I was very interested in going back to the debate. Sebastian Ertel was opposed to the congressional term limits, and he'd done some research on how uh, how long people had been in the House and in the Senate federally on average, and it was shockingly low. Like the House was like eight to 10 years and the Senate was like eight to 10 years as well. I mean, that's barely over one term. And so the other question I have, and I spent some time looking through legislators and how long they've been there. I don't even know that this is necessarily a, a problem of people staying in for like 20, 30, 40 years. I mean, there's a couple, but most- Bob, it's, Bob Martinson, you know, Ray Holmberg, there's a, there's a couple yeah. that have been there for a while. But then also, why is that inherently a bad thing? Like if Ray it's Holmberg- not. Ray Holmberg's been there for, uh, what's the count? 44 years, I think. Um, well, you know, if people, is that an inherently bad thing? Or are the people well, at Grand Forks in his district just happy with the job he's been doing? Ray Holmberg is a good legislator. Bob Martinson's a good legislator, and they deliver for their folks at home, and that's why they continue to get reelected. And both of them get reelected in districts that are competitive, right? These are districts that, I mean, District 35 is Democrats and Republicans. Um, 
Ray's district historically has been members of both parties. So clearly Grand, they're Grand doing Forks is a little right. more of a Republican town than it has been historically. But generally, that was a that was a very purple area of our state. Yep. Yeah. And, and Ray used to be in the same district as Representative Wheezy Potter, who was a Democrat, you know, within the last 10 years or so. So, I mean, clearly they know what they're doing. But again, I don't think kind of like a redistricting on the left uh, is people think it's this magic thing that's going to change government. Even if this was implemented, it's not going to drastically change things other than a handful of folks uh, in each chamber that stick around. If it was 12 or 16 years, again, I think eight is ridiculous because that would affect a lot more people. But it's not like people are staying for decades. They're staying for three, four terms tops. Well, let's, and let's face it, North Dakota is a citizen legislature and they don't get paid a lot. The time oh. commitment it takes is enormous. Um uh, it's not exactly the cush, cushy plum job. I mean, listen, there's some benefits. The health insurance is fantastic. I heard as somebody who's in the private sector. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I may or may not know some. You may or may not know something about that. Yeah. Insurance. But the um, it, it's just it's it's a it's a frustrating thing. So as as policy, I, I think it's about. You said something interesting about maybe being more supportive of it for the executive branch, for the governor then. And I, I think I, the reason why I kind of agree with that, although I, I don't support, I, I really, I, ultimately I just want voters to vote who they want to vote for. I'm a right. big proponent of voters getting what they voted for good and hard. Um, if you don't like it, vote for somebody else, right? Or, or, or get involved in the process and find better candidates for your party, whatever. Um, I, you said a really interesting thing. And one of the reasons why I also don't support term limits, particularly for the legislature, is that our legislature is already very, very constrained. In, in the, they're only in, in, in session, you know, barring a special session or a, or a redistricting year, which only happens every 10 years. Um, they're only in session 80 days every two years. And usually it's just one session every two years. And they don't really have a lot of power to do stuff outside of that session. So you're taking an already very, very constrained part-time legislature. They don't have staff. Some of them have enormous, physically, in, geographically enormous legislative districts that they have to cover. Uh, and then you're also telling them that you have to, I mean, what is that going to do but empower the executive branch and empower the bureaucracy? And I, I don't want to run down. I think, I think North Dakota's public workers are, are great overall. I work with them all the time. I do open records requests. I think they're honest, hardworking people that are just trying to do a job. So I don't want to make it sound like they're going to like twist their mustaches and be like, oh, ha, ha, right. you know, but you're you by, by term limiting the legislature, you are creating a, a different power dynamic. And I, again, I don't think like evil people are going to exploit it, but it's just a different power dynamic and it's going to result in us being governed differently. And I think I want balance between the branches the other, of government. That's how it's the supposed other to work. The po power dynamic that shifts dramatically is the less experienced legislators you have, the more power lobbyists have. And I by no means am somebody who demonizes lobbyists. I think lobbyists have an important role in this process. I mean, we need experts. Legislators can't be experts in every uh, every aspect of government and in the private sector. Um, Lobbyists are powerful in this state, right? I mean, it wasn't that long ago we, we refer to lobbyists as being like uh, important. They would be the staff, the legislators, and the lobbyists are the three groups that work together during the legislative session. Um, but this would create more power. I mean, I think the less experienced a legislator is, the more they'll lean on, on lobbyists uh, for information and lobbyists obviously uh, – are trying to influence folks. because they're so going to be they're going to be the ones with the institutional knowledge that we were just talking about like oh we did it this way 10 years ago or you know 15 years ago we had the same problem and this is what we did then i mean a lot of that knowledge is kept by the people who were in the legislature 15 years ago yep. we can remember or it, and, and talk and, and served with people who were served in the legislature for 20 15 or 20 years before that uh, it's uh, it's a bad idea so that that's the policy side of it I say let the voters vote for who they want to vote for, and if they keep voting for the same people over and over again, well, then that's the will of the people. Um, that's democracy. That's how we're going to live. So let's talk about the politics. Do you agree with me that this is this is very much a product of the rift in the North Dakota Republican Party? A absolutely. You know, I've been thinking – you and I had sort of a, a Facebook chat the other day in private message. Yeah. But 
ever the last time I was on, we were talking about recalling the governor and how dumb the politics for the 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 Bastiat folks was to try to recall somebody with a seventy percent approval rating. And we encourage them to do something that they could win. And I think they found an issue here that's going to appeal to North Dakotans. And I know you referenced that it's been shot down three times. I keep seeing that, but I don't. When's the last time voters actually voted on term limits? I can't imagine it's been in my adult know. life. I can't remember it. I think I believe the one. I, th- I thought the three times were in the legislature. So well, of course they voted against it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, come on. I, I, you listen. Term limits are a thing that that um, a lot of politicians like to pay lip service to. You know, there's been a lot of politicians, uh, Governor Ber- Doug Burgum among them. You know, and I think if if their purpose was to put Doug Burgum in a little bit of an embarrassment, I think that's a that's a crap reason to to run a statewide initiated measure campaign. But if your if your goal was to to make Doug Burgum look like a little bit of a hypocrite because he didn't live up to the rhetoric of his of his of his campaign advertising um you know i I guess mission accomplished and i I, listen i've been i like doug burgum i voted for doug burgum um i have always thought that his campaign style when he like his sort of retail politics is about as authentic as a three dollar bill um i think i think a lot of it comes from he hires consultants and he just kind of outsources the whole thing to them they write up tested words people like term limits as a concept but do you really think this has a good chance of passing i do and i would also just point out that it wasn't just Burgum's campaign in 2016 the primary yeah. in 2020 in district 8 when they're going after delzer the governor's uh pack used term limits a, a, a bunch in the advertising in favor of the candidates they were supporting here's the deal i think i've seen polling that's overwhelmingly in support of term limits. Devil's in the details, it always is, but I think people's yeah. gut response is in support of term limits. And I don't think somebody as smart as Doug Burgum and the team he has around him would be running yeah. ads in 2016 and 2020 to yeah. support term limits unless they saw something in their polling as well that indicated there yeah. was strong support. But it's that. it's it's one of those funny things about Apollo. Like it's it's saying uh, if you're going to run on balancing the budget, right? Everybody supports balancing the budget. The problem is mm-hmm. when you get down to, okay, which taxes are we going to raise or or which spending are we going to cut? Boy, that gets that idea gets a lot less popular very quickly. And I, I think I told you that I had seen some poll, poll, uh, polling where it didn't look so good. And the reason why it didn't look so good is it was just, it was a plurality supporting it is what I saw. And I, I, I didn't have, you know, I wasn't given all the, the nitty gritty of the poll. So I can't, you know, I was just, somebody just shared a top level result with me, but, uh, but I, I trust them. And I, I think the polling's probably sound. It was a plurality in favor of it. So, I mean, that looks good, but the problem is, is I don't think that this is going to survive the argument very well. And and we've seen that with ballot measures in the past. I remember there was a conservation um, where we were going to take some of the oil money and we were going to use it for conservation things. And that initially pulled through the roof, pulled very, very strongly. And then we had a, a statewide debate about it and it, it didn't even get 30 percent of the vote on, on the ballot. So but Rob, help me understand who is going to come out and publicly fund and publicly speak against term limits in a state like North Dakota. Yeah, uh, I, I would, I mean, there's, I, I think there's going to be probably not the politicians themselves, but you're probably going to have interest groups that are going to come out. I don't know. I, and I don't want to, maybe the state chamber of commerce. I mean, there's, there's money out there to kill this. Um, who will come forward? I, I don't know. Your, your, your guess is as good as mine. Um, but, but I, 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 but, but I mean, suspect. But those usual suspects that kill the conservation measure that, you know, I, I worked on the, the property tax measure with the chamber and other groups. Those are pretty wide coalitions that come together to defeat something that is very, very popular on the front end, like getting rid of property taxes. Sure. People understand term limits. It's not like you can just say a scare tactic, uh, not a scare tactic, but, you know, a slogan and run ads. I mean, I think people have like. They know what term limits are. Sure. They don't, they don't, well, you know, the, the, the thing that's tough is, so I've seen polling that's with 80% of people who like term limits, but they also like the North Dakota legislature. They also like Doug Burgum. So how so does I think that that's, sort th- of work its way through? I think that's going to be the problem is they're going to say, if you like Doug Burgum, well, if he wants to run for another term, this, mem- obviously Doug Burgum would be grandfathered in, but 
in the future, if you have a governor like Doug Burgum, and he served, he or she has served two terms, and you want to vote for him for a third term, this says you can't. I mean, that that's the fundamental argument against term limits is this tells you that you can't vote for some people. This limits your choices at the ballot box. And when it, and 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 I think there's also a hypocrisy where you know you look at the personnel who are backing it is going to be a problem because these are people who have not made themselves a lot of friends in state politics. I think they're going to have a very difficult time building a coalition for it. And the fact that they chose just the governor and just the legislature and not the other statewide offices. I think I think there's some very simple arguments you can make. This limits who you can vote for. And also, these, these ideologues that are backing it are so addled by their politics, they're not even really committed to the principle. They only made it for the governor because they don't like Doug Burgum. They didn't do it for the insurance commissioner or the attorney general or the secretary of state, just him. Um, I think you can make some of those arguments, and I, I think they're going to have a tough time getting around it. You know, Rob, one of the first times I was on your show, you talked about um, basically the voter's intellect. And I chose not to touch what you said about the voter's intellect. I think you're giving the voters far too much credit of sort of diving in to the for and against arguments of something that is a gut response, term limits, good I don't care what else you say. Career politicians, bad. I don't care what else you say. Yeah. And I also think things have changed dramatically during the Trump era you know, in a state, again, that overwhelmingly still supports the president, that I think there's still this overwhelmingly North Dakotans right now support Donald Trump and they want to fight the man, right? Yeah. And right now the man is a career politician, but no matter that- who it is. But but is that true? Because I've I've been arguing that that sort of movement, the boss, I think they're I think they're paper tigers. I think they're great at making a lot of noise. I think they're great at identifying issues that people do have a visceral a, a visceral reaction to. But it's also often a very shallow reaction. If you can make the argument, I think that you can overcome that. Um, and you know maybe 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 I'm wrong. I, I guess we'll see. But I, I mean I don't think I don't think the counter arguments to term limits is that complex. I, I think you're, there's a saying in politics that I'm sure you've heard: if you're explaining, you're dying. And that right. a lot of times, so so term limits, you're right. It's simple. People understand it immediately. You don't have to do a lot of explaining. But you also don't have to do a lot of explaining to make the counter argument either. The counter argument against it is also very simple. And so, I mean, it'll be interesting. I don't want to say it's a dog and that it's just going to die. But I, I would. That's not if I, if you were asking me to put a hundred dollars down right now on whether or not it passes, I don't think it passes. Um, I would take that bet in a heartbeat. You would take that bet in a heartbeat. Yeah, uh, and yeah. P- part of the reason I'm saying this too is you look at you know oh North Dakota so pro Trump pro Trump. Um, again, a lot of the polling we've seen on Trump is is Trump versus a Democrat. Um, I don't know that North Dakota is as hardcore pro Trump as. As a lot of as 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 I think maybe the backers of this and, and not that Trump is necessarily, but it's it's kind of in that that oeuvre. Um, so I th- think they they consistently make the mistake of thinking that North Dakota is more conservative than it is. So and, I think the the polling I've seen is favorable uh, of Donald Trump, not not against a Democrat, but fave on fave, and he's very popular. The question is going to come down to is the people have a favorable opinion of Donald Trump and also have a favorable opinion of Doug Burgum and John Hoven and other sort of traditional Republicans, where do they fall on this? Where, you know, and I, I would be interested in seeing, because the polling I've seen isn't eight years. The polling I've seen is like 12 or a little bit longer. Does that make a difference to 10% of the voters, 15% of the voters? Because, I mean, really, all you got to do is just sort of chip away, right? If you're the opponents of this thing and just sort of, I mean, that's the nice thing about being on the no side. You just cause confusion and yeah. a lot of the times, North Dakotans will um, vote no just if, well, if they're confused. I mean, I mean a, lo- a lot of a lot of these people. You could say, remember the third time you voted for John Hoven for governor, right? You remember, you remember the uh, you remember the the eighth time you voted for Ray Holmberg, you know, or, but, or the eighth time you voted for Al Jagger. Um, but when was, when was John Hoven elected the third time? What year was that? Twenty. Uh, it was twenty twelve. 2012. Right. No, wait. Changed. No, two, 2008. I'm sorry. He would have ended his okay. second term in 2008. So 2009 uh, was, was the beginning of his. He left in 2010. Dalrymple yeah. was elected in 12. So 12 years, 
there's a lot that's changed in politics in North Dakota in the last decade in terms of being more conservative and and being more. I mean, I, again, I blame you for the Tea Party stuff to, to starting this, but um, I think a lot has changed, and I do think the 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 run the 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 Joe Blow voter in North Dakota supports term limits. And there's going to have to be a pretty sophisticated campaign to defeat this thing. And I'm not sure if I'm the state chamber of commerce, I want to be the group out leading against something that's popular. I mean, it's easy to demonize the environmentalists, right? It's easy to to demonize people on the fringe. I think there's a lot of -of run-of-the-mill folks that just think um, term limits makes a lot of sense and career politicians uh, are bad. You know, we don't need North Dakota's Nancy Pelosi out here, right? We don't need, um, I'm trying to think of a Republican uh, like Nancy Pelosi in Washington right now, but there's very few that have been around as long but as if, the But, if, but if, if, if voters actually felt that way, and again, th- this gets into a problem where voters can be schizophrenic, where right. you know we want, we want to balance the budget, but we also don't want to cut any spending or raise any taxes. Like, well, something's got to give. Um, you know, voters, I, I, I think it's going to be powerful, is you should be allowed to vote for who you want to vote for. I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a hard argument to make. You should be allowed to vote for who you want to vote for. And in fact, you have because in any given election cycle, the people who win the most elections are the incumbents. Um, you know, it, I, I think I think you made a, a really it's, it is eye opening when you look at how long members of, of the U.S. House of Representatives, the U.S. Senate actually serve. But also, if you look at the reelection rates of the people who because a lot of those people are resigning after a couple of terms, yeah. if you look at the reelection. I mean, they're like 80, 90 percent consistently. Um, even in the in the house, which you would think would turn over more often, it's like it's like ninety percent, eighty eighty high eighties, low ninety percent reelection. So that's how so voters that's- actually behave. I mean, it's one thing to say I support term limits. What I think is far more important is how do they actually behave, and how they actually behave is they like reelecting incumbents. Or do they like reelecting Republicans, right? I mean, if the different, I mean, it's sort of like you're saying Trump versus Hillary Clinton. You can understand why people voted for Trump in that scenario. If you're living in a district and you've got longtime Republican legislator versus Democrat, you're going to vote for whatever that Republican is on the ballot. So maybe you do think that there should be somebody new. But if that's the only given choice, and we know how few people participate in like the district conventions and the primaries and all that kind of stuff. So um, I don't know. I think there's probably going to be a lot of vote, folks out there who vote for John Hoven for a third term, but also like the idea of term limits when put in front of them. I think it's going to be it, fascinating. It, it, it'll it'll think- be interesting to watch. And I, I feel like some trends are kind of probably develop early when they when they get this on the ballot. I, somebody was emailing me saying that they aren't going to get this. Of course, they're going to get the signatures in North Dakota. Whoever can pay the signature collectors can get the signature. So it's going to be on the ballot. Um, but it, it's it, another reason why I'm, I'm, I don't think it'll pass is, is you look at this spring when, when the, the demographic that is probably most likely to support term limits came out and tried to take over the North Dakota Republican party and they failed. Um, right. they, they failed. Uh, and, and they, I mean, they made it clear. It was about Trump. It was about it was about Luke Simons. It was about sticking it to Doug Burgum. It was about let's stick it to these career politicians, we the people, all that stuff, and they failed. Um, I, 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 what I, percentage? I, what percentage of North Dakotans are participating in that process? Yeah, right. I mean, we're talking about a. a is, this would be on the general. But I, but, I th- but I think. But I think that I think that makes my argument right because the people who do participate are the most politically active. They came out in droves, and they still couldn't do it. Yeah, and I think the, the 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 person who maybe isn't as politically active is more likely to support term limits than the people who are politically active. I mean, I talk to people who aren't politically active. They don't know the importance of having a majority leader who's got some seniority in the legislature, right? They they don't they don't know that. They think that we, if it were a citizen legislature, we should move people out. And so I I, I just think that if you have the election tomorrow, this would pass overwhelmingly. And the, ca- and the campaign is going to be super interesting to see who comes out. And how does the Republican Party handle this? I mean, is it another thing that just drives a wedge right between these two groups again? Um, I, I think it's going to be I, it's going to be fascinating. So so let me because one of your, one of your arguments was was, you know, who's going to make the negative argument against this? And I guess my argument to you is 
who's going to make the affirmative argument against this? Because I can think of a lot of people who could come out and say they're against term limits. I think Ed Schaefer would probably come out and say he's against term limits. I suspect that John Hoven never really likes to get in front of anything. But I've had many interviews with Kevin Kramer where he said he's against term limits. He'll say something. Um, those are a lot of pretty high octane political people in North Dakota who are going to be saying this is a bad idea. And are going to be able to articulate and, and speak very credibly to Republican voters in North Dakota, which is the largest voting base in, in the state. And I, I think be very, very persuasive to them and say, listen, this is why this is why I mean, not only am I against term limits, but obviously I've run, you know, for one term after another and been in office for a long time. I think they're going to be able to articulate arguments against this that are going to be very, very powerful. So who's making the pro side? Rick Becker? I, I don't. Charles, Charles you know, Tuttle? Yeah, well, and I think that, I mean, it depends on how the campaign is run. If I was running the proponent's campaign, I wouldn't have any spokesperson. I would take all that money from U.S. term limits and run TV commercials that just talk about the importance of term limits and keep it as simple as possible. And I would also shorten the campaign as much as possible, because, again, the less people know, the more likely they are to vote for term limits, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and I don't know that Kevin Kramer and John Hoven are great spokespeople, you know, being opposed to this as sort of career politicians. Uh, I mean, again, they might rally a, a certain segment of activists, but I mean, John Hoven's been in office for a long time. Kevin Kramer has been in, you know, office his whole adult life, uh, pretty much. Um, I don't, if I were, if I were the people trying to defeat this thing, I would roll out a bunch of career politicians saying term limits are bad, but what do I know? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> when was the last time you won an election? Um, well, I, I, mean, I have won some statewide <laughs> elections, Rob. Really? When? I managed both of Roger Johnson's campaigns. Oh, yeah, all right. All right. Fair enough. Uh, I was just talking about Roger Johnson, actually, earlier today in my column about uh, who's running and who's not, um, which was pretty interesting. Al Jagger, not running. Uh, make him the face of the uh, of the anti-term uh, <laughs> limits. Uh, By the way, I think you missed one in your column about who's going to run for Secretary of State. Uh, Jim Silrum? No, mine was Scott Meyer. Scott I Meyer, think you Senator think so? Scott Meyer's I also heard uh, after the thing is, is after I write something like that, I get all the all the rumors I haven't heard uh, accumulate in my yeah. inbox. Uh, Representative Scott Lauser from Minot too was another name that really? uh, that popped up that he was potentially interesting. So that's I and I, I haven't talked to those people about it specific. Uh, Jim Silrum, I, I guess, has been talking to people. He seems more in it than uh than maybe the other two the other two i haven't i haven't spoken to them so i don't know it's in the rumor yeah, I, mill but there's always a lot of things in the rumor mill i think jim jim serum will have a tough time uh if there's a bunch of sort of like well i suppose jim has been like a district chair and stuff too so it's not like he hasn't been involved in the republican party i yeah. just know him as a role in the secretary of state's office so he might be more wide widely known than i give him credit for it would be yeah yeah well, and, and it's, I mean, with lawmakers, it's hard to know how, how widely known are they. Um, yeah. You, you never know. Um, it will be, you're, you're right, interesting. Um, the, the, the interesting thing you said about trotting out some career politicians and having them make this argument, the rebuttal to that is the reason why they get to be career politicians is because the voters voted for them over yeah. and over again. And rebutting myself, they're all really popular, too, the yeah. voters, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, they have the I mean, they consistently get, you know, Kelly Armstrong, I think, will probably speak out against this. He just won his last election with about 70 percent of the vote. So I, I so don't know. I think I, I actually think Kelly is a good spokesperson on this because he served in the Senate. He can speak from a perspective of being a legislator and what this would mean. I think he would be an interesting person. And obviously, he's got some political capital to spend. He's also uh, uh, he's also very glib. I, I love Kelly Armstrong. I just interviewed him last week and he had his he had his camera sitting on something. And Kelly Armstrong, I don't know if you've ever watched the video of him when he was in the state Senate. Famous for getting himself tangled up in his microphone cord all the time, yep. right? Stand up, and he's so kinetic, like he'd get up, he'd fight in his cord, right? Because he's just so anxious. <laughs> and he was, he was, I mean, he was sitting at the table, and like, like I don't know if he was like bouncing his leg or something, but like the camera the whole time was like, <laughs> it was like Kelly, sit still. We're trying to do an interview. I think he would be a good spokesperson. Um, I think he would be a good spokesperson for it. I, I, I think the argument against this is easier. I think sometimes. In politics, I think we sometimes we outsmart ourselves and and we start assuming that that this is this and this is going to do this. And 
I mean, like in baseball, right? There's a reason why we play the games. You do all the analytics and you do the forecast and this team should get 95 wins and this game team should get 85 wins. And then you play the games. And uh, like my favorite baseball broadcaster, John Sterling says, well, that's baseball, Susan. Um, <laughs> so it's, 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 it's going to be interesting. And, and I love it because this is a great one for political nerds, right? Cause it's, it's just this, it's, uh, it's really going to pit what voters say superficially against what they do. Right. Um, and, and what are they going to do when they come to the ballot box? And you're right. I mean, to, to, to your, it's a fair rebuttal of me to say that I at times have a low, I don't want to say a low opinion of the intelligence of the electorate. I have a low opinion of just how much the electorate is paying attention. Um, I, th- I think I think at times they're easily manipulated. And it gets into all those arguments about why the founding fathers tried to protect us from direct democracy. A lot of times, the masses are easily manipulated. Um, you know, well, so, so, I think it, sorry, go ahead. I also think it's going to be interesting on on what the rank and file Democrats in the state do. I mean, I, was, I wanted to ask majority. you that question: Are Democrats going? Because I I got to think. I mean, do you guys want to turn over Josh Boucher? So, I don't. What, what I would say to it is, and I wouldn't think about, like, what do Democrats who are really paying attention would think about this, because that's a pretty small percentage. But when you talk about statewide, that it's I mean, 25, 30 percent of the voters, is the rank and file Democrat going to say term limits are good because it's all bad guys in there right now? You know, it can't get worse than it is right now. Um, you know, so I think there's going to be a lot so, of people. So, so like you, me, there's a lot of Democrats who do it just because... It, it's going to create more opportunities for Democrats to win elections, basically. I think that might be the thinking around the countryside. I think uh, there's a lot of people like me who understand the bigger picture. But I, I'm interested to see how Dems handle this. And again, not not like Dems that are really involved, but instead Dems who um, just vote in the general election. And, um, you know, I, I think there's a chance they're just going to say throw all the bums out. I still think it's a compelling because that's an argument you can make. If you really like, if you really like Ray Holmberg, you can't vote. And again, understanding that yep. some people no, are, are grandfathered in. But if you really like your lawmaker, you can't vote for him again. You know, one day you yeah. may elect another Josh Boucher, and you really like him. You like the cut of his jib. You think he's doing a good job. You can't vote for him after two cycles. He has to run for the Senate. You know, maybe take on a Democrat who's already there if he wants to do it. I, I that's I, I think I think that's going to I think that's going to resonate with voters saying, you know, this sounds good at a superficial level. But when you dig into it, um, it's really going to limit who you can vote for. And it's going to limit our legislature's ability to be a check on the other branches. of And you can get into a lot of other arguments. And regardless of party. Right. I mean, if you like your legislator, you should be able to vote for whoever you want. Right. Regardless of how long they've been there. And again, I don't think I should uh, be uh, voting on state policy that limits the other 46 districts on who they can and cannot vote for. And also future electorates, because when we make this, it's not just for the people who are voting today. It's for the people, you know, assuming it doesn't get overturned or something, is is for the people voting down the line. Let me ask you that this question about that. We're, we're limiting the legislature's ability to overturn um a, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't I, just much much in the same way you don't want any like one legislature to limit the ability of future legislators. Um, I don't I don't see how it's constitutional to tell the legislature that they can't legislate. So I was unaware of that until you brought it up at the beginning of the show here. So I haven't thought a lot about that, but my gut response is the same as you. I mean, it sounds terrible, and it sounds like it shouldn't be something that's possible uh, for you to tell the legislature that they can't change something why yeah why would this be different than anything else uh that's changed in the constitution or through the initiated measure process i don't know it doesn't make sense to me i i and i and this idea too because it's you could carve out like one section of the state constitution and say the legislature can't touch this i i don't that's that's not how it works we don't even do that at the federal level right i mean technically the Bill of Rights, up to and including like something as sacred as the First Amendment, could be repealed or could be amended. Like you could do that. Um, mm-hmm. Second Amendment, you know, Fourth Amendment, you could amend those things. It's possible, and and honestly, it should be possible. As much as I don't want to change anything about the First Amendment or the Second Amendment or some of these things, it's I think it it's should possible. be possible. And I I think that's a really terrible idea for for closing that down. Um, 
let's uh, let's close out our. La- oh, do you have something else you wanted to add? Because I'm oh, going to no, switch gears. I was, so I, I, you know, the person who said I don't think they'll get the signatures. I think that I agree with you that it's anybody can get the signatures if right. they have the resources yeah. behind it. I just don't know. Does U.S. term limits? I mean, how deep are their pockets? I mean, do you have any idea how much money? Uh, is going to get poured into this thing. I, I, I mean, as we've talked about before, it's like a quarter of a million to get the signatures, and then you have to run a campaign on top of that. That's, that's the going rate, yeah. Um, I, um, I, I am told by people who work in marketing in the state that they they have some money. You know, they they would be a serious okay. they would have they would be a serious customer. So I I think in terms of and also remember that doing politics like we're talking about three hundred thousand that's a lot of money. Uh, you know, you run a campaign in New York, right? Like that's right. that's nothing. So this is a national group. North Dakota is a pretty cheap place to do politics. Um, you know, even if they're kind of a marginal national group, I don't think they're going to have trouble playing ball here. Um, so I I think they'll have the money to uh, to get yeah. that done. Um. The other question I wanted to ask, well, let's let's switch. Oh, oh, okay. Here, boy, I'm all over the map. But I just thought of something too. Um, another thing that's going to be tough for these is that they're kind of tied to the same people who are trying to run the recall Doug Burgum thing. Um, I mean, they, I, they that that faction of the Republican Party has really burned a lot of bridges and has lost a lot of cred- credibility very quickly. And the fact that so many of them are on this sponsoring committee is going to be is going to be tough for them. Well, I'm interested if there's going to be people out there carrying both petitions. Yeah. You know, are you going to be carrying a petition for term limits and a petition to recall Doug Burgum? I think because, there's going to be. Oh, I don't think that's good messaging for term limits. I don't think so at all. All right. So I wrote a column today about our incumbents, who's running, who's not. Any surprises there for you? Al Jagger, a lot of people were, uh, were telling me that they weren't going to believe that Al Jagger wasn't going to run for another term until they saw it. But he told me, Flat out, not running, you know, I'm done. Uh, which, which, by the way, good for Al. Uh, you know, I've had my yeah. problems with him and my criticisms of him, but, I mean, anybody who steps up and serves their state like that for that long. And and I think overall, again, setting aside some quibbles I could make, did a good job um, at, at a time where increasingly we, we don't trust our election officials. I think Al Jagger, I think, is somebody most people trust. Um, yeah. You know, I, you know, I wasn't I – wasn't wasn't surprised by any of them. Um, you know, maybe Ryan Rauschenberger not saying for sure he was running again was a little bit surprising to me. Yeah. And the more I think about, I mean, I think you said that he'll likely end up running. But this, I mean, he's been there for eight years now. I mean, you know, this is sort of the time often with these down ballots statewide where they try to figure out how to move their way up or move into the private sector. So um, that might be one that's interesting, although I would I would assume he runs again. Um, you know, Goring, how long has Goring been in there now since, oh. Goring was, a, he was the first appointed, I, I literally just wrote it in the column. But 10. He, yeah, he was, was he 2010? was 29. Okay. I forget. It was when your old boss left. I don't know how neither of yeah. us can remember this timeline. I just wrote about it. You worked for the guy he replaced. So I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah, I feel like it was probably 2010. He's been elected uh, to three in his own right, so he's at least 12 plus whatever he finished from from uh, Roger. Roger Johnson's last term. So, so maybe like 14, 15 years he's been in there. Yeah, I mean that's a pretty long time. Um, although I don't know, you know, it's a, it's a good gig, and I don't know if if Doug has. I don't think there's anywhere else for a lot of these guys to go in terms of political ambition. Um, so I think you'll that's end a, that's up with the thing in Republic. It's all Republicans. I mean, if you want to go anywhere, you're going to have to fight another Republican until somebody leaves, oh. which is why there's so many people who want to be secretary of state. Al's leaving, right? There's finally or, an opening. Or go to the private sector, right? Or I go mean, to the private there, sector. There, yeah. There's, there's things that, that you can do and not be a, a career statewide elected official. Well, right. I, what I mean, if you want to advance your political career, right. You know, there's only so yeah. many offices unless you want to, like, go down and serve in the legislature or something, which um, I don't know. I, I tend to think that there's executive branch people and there's legislative branch people and you don't often see them. Uh, mix up. Ed Schaefer always told me something very interesting about John Hoven is he never really felt like Hoven was an executive branch guy. He always thought that Hoven would be a lot more comfortable in the legislative branch. And I got to tell you, having watched him for so many years in the in the executive branch and now having watched him in the Senate since 2010, 
I gotta say, I agree. I think he's much. I think that's a much better fit for. Not that he was a bad governor. I think he's a lot more comfortable in the legislative branch. I think he. I think he's. I think he's more skillful. I think his skill set translates better to the legislature than to the executive branch. That's interesting because I've always assumed that Hoven would end up getting bored being in the senator and being one of 100 because he had that, you know, 10 years of being the executive that it's a little bit harder. Um, so, I mean, I thought a few years ago, there's a chance that Hoven wouldn't run this time just because, I mean, he's been there for two terms and I mean, it's a grind being in Washington these days, but I mean, it sounds like he's going for sure. Obviously Kelly, I mean, he's going to be in Congress. As, Typic until typically to- succinct Kelly Armstrong. I said, I, I know you are, but I have to, I texted him. I said, I know you are, but I have to ask you the question just because I want to be able to say that I asked you the question. Are you going to run again? And instead of giving me like a statement, he just texted back. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's Kelly Armstrong well, I, for you. I think it'll be interesting what Kelly, you know, where he goes in the future. Does he end up when, you know, when there is an open governor's race or an attorney general's race or a U.S. Senate seat, I think he's going to have some options. The, the rumor is, is that if, if Bergam were to not run for a third term, Kelly would probably be one of the first to announce for that one. I think, I yeah. think Kelly would enjoy being governor. I, I say that Kelly has not said that to me specifically. I'm not. Uh, that's not based on anything he's told me. That's just based on a lot of people expect that he would run for governor and that would not at all surprise me. Um, I, it did surprise me that Brent Sanford didn't want to run for secretary of state. I thought that he might be in on that. I kind of thought he was maybe looking for an avenue out of Burgum's shadow. Um, I don't think he's going to be on the ticket if Burgum runs for a third term. Um, and I, I say that being lieutenant governor, much like being vice president, that's a tough gig because you get all of the responsibility for the decisions that the boss is making and a very limited to ability make- <laughs> to, to make those decisions. I, but I, I also think Lieutenant Governor could be a great gig as well, because right. you don't have to make tough decisions. Well, that's and, just- and, and presiding over the Senate isn't that difficult. Yeah, although some people like to be in office to lead, Chad, and not True. just, not just uh, you know, show up uh, when the governor, <laughs> show up to meetings that the governor doesn't want to go to. Go cut those ribbons. I always, I always like, and I, I don't know if I've told you this joke before. I, I think it's a Lloyd Omdahl joke, but he says, you know, why does the lieutenant governor not look out the window in the morning so he has something to do in the afternoon? Uh, <laughs> which I always thought was, uh, was, uh, was pretty great. Um, yeah. Anything else there as far as uh, Democrats? Because I, I wrote that thing about Republicans, like who's not going to run, and, and it's. You know, obviously, you know, Josh Boucher told me he's definitely not interested in secretary of state. The hard thing for me to handicap who Democrats are going to run is it seems like Democrats don't know until we get to right before convention time for a lot of these offices. Uh, And it's I I don't know how to handicap that. Rest assured, Democrats wish they knew before it got right before the filing deadline. I mean, it's just it's a tough uh, it's a tough case to make to somebody that basically you have to say, hey, give up a year of your life to run for statewide office. It's horribly unlikely that you're going to win. I think the last time a Democrat- With an attitude like that, it sure is. (laughs) Well, but the last time a a Democrat beat a Republican incumbent statewide, I believe was Kent Conrad beating Mark Andrews in 1986. I mean- Oh my God, has it been- I'm uh, trying to I, think I, of another I, one. I mean, because uh, Heidi Heitkamp beat Rick Berg, but he wasn't the incumbent. He was going from House to Senate. Right. Um, Roger Johnson won an open seat. Kathy Gilmore won an open seat. Oh, my Lord. Um, I think you're Glenn right. Glenn Pomeroy took it from an open seat for a Democrat. Well, when Heidi became attorney general, I don't know. That there's there's a, a That was an open seat, research. too, though, wasn't it? I don't know. I I'd have to so. go back and look. That's that's before my time. I didn't even move to so, North Dakota until 1990. So, so, Rob, if I'm going out and telling you you should give up a year of your life to raise money and go to parades and no Democrats beat an incumbent since 1986, I assume you jump at the opportunity. Yeah. No, I can't. I can't afford. Uh, believe it or not, people have tried to have tried to recruit me to run for well, run for the legislature. Um I told him, I said, why, you realize what I do for a living, right? How do you think that works? Like, I'm just going to go in and be in the committee room and be like a blogger. And then also, (laughs) like, who would talk to me, right, about the candid conversations that lawmakers are going to have? And by the way, I say as a member of the media, I understand sometimes they're going to want to have, as a member of the media, as weird as it sounds, I kind of believe in the smoky back room. Um, 
I, I, I think I think there's there's sometimes there's got to be a venue where people can let their hair down and make the goddamn sausage. Right. Well, and I, I, I kind of like the idea of you writing your first column as an insider at the Capitol. Yeah. And then just watching everybody there on out just not talk to you anymore. Yeah, like, exactly. Not, everything's on the record. Everything is on the record all the time. Um, yeah. No, that wouldn't that wouldn't work. I cannot run for any office. Don't want to run for office. Can't afford the pay cut. So um, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> you like that line? Yeah. Cadillac. Big, big media. Big yeah. Media making big us media. Big money. That's right. You know, being a colony, it comes with a bow of poverty is what it comes with. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Forum's great to me. My my employers at the Fargo Forum are wonderful to me. They really are. You know, um, I'm joking. You know, Rob, if you ever want to have a conversation about um, unionizing those columnists over at the Forum, you let me know. I know some guys. Hey, I you may be surprised. I believe uh, anybody who wants to join a labor union should be allowed to. I wouldn't. I like I probably that. wouldn't. Um, but, uh, my wife's going to be a teacher here soon. I told her she should check it out. You know, maybe it's for her, maybe it's not, but I, I, I believe, I believe in the freedom of association where people can associate themselves with who they want to associate with. If that's a labor union, if that's a, which, which by the way is also my argument against, um, you know, people get upset about dark money and all this stuff. Listen, if you want to belong to the NRA, you can, and if you want to give the NRA your money, so they could turn around and, and pursue the policy agendas of the NRA or Planned Parenthood or any of these other organizations, uh, you should go for it. It's... Well, here's what I would say. If your wife becomes a teacher in Minot, uh, the Minot Education Association is one of the best local unions in the whole state of North we'll Dakota. And That's her decision, it. not mine. I'm just uh, like I'm just going to enjoy her uh, her sweet, sweet government health insurance. You, Her sweet, sweet union negotiated government health insurance yeah yeah that's right <laughs> chad thanks for your time this was fun this is going to be a fun campaign to watch it's going to make the bat the, the 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 campaign actually interesting i think in 2020 well we'll be we'll be talking about it too a lot on a plane talk and i'll be writing about it I'm, I'm glad it came along i was i always i always worry about these election cycles being boring and thankfully something always comes along to uh give me something to write about so that's a good thing keep keep rob yeah. port employed <laughs> All right. Very good. Talk to you later. Later. Bye.